When Michael got out of the cab in front of the French hospital, he was surprised to see that the street was completely deserted. When he entered the hospital, he was even more surprised to find the lobby empty. Damn it, what the hell were Clemenza and Tessio doing? Sure, they never went to West Point, but they knew enough about tactics to have outposts. A couple of their men should have been in the lobby, at least. He didn't bother to stop at the information desk. He already knew his father's room number up on the fourth floor. Michael went in. There was a figure in the bed. And by the December moonlight, straining through the window, Michael could see his father's face. Even now, it was impassive. The chest heaved shallowly with his uneven breath. Tubes hung from steel gallows beside the bed and ran into his nose. Michael stayed there for a few moments to make sure his father was all right. He took the phone from its cradle and got the hospital operator to give him the house in Long Beach, the phone in the corner office room. Sonny answered. Sonny, I'm down at the hospital. I came down late. Sonny, there's nobody here. None of Tessio's people, no detectives at the door. The old man was completely unprotected. His voice was trembling. There was a long silence, and then Sonny's voice came, low and impressed. This is Salazzo's move you were talking about. That's what I figured, too. But how did he get the cops to clear everybody out, and where did they go? What happened to Tessio's men? Jesus Christ, has that bastard Salazzo got the New York Police Department in his pocket, too? Take it easy, kid. I'll have some men there inside of 15 minutes, as soon as I make some calls. He hung up the phone and rang the buzzer for the nurse. Do you have an empty room? At the end of the hall. It was done in a matter of moments, very quickly and very efficiently. Stay here with him until help comes. If you're outside at your station, you might get hurt. At that moment, he heard his father's voice from the bed, hoarse but full of strength. Michael? Is it you? What happened? What is it? Michael leaned over the bed. He took his father's hand in his. It's Mike. Don't be afraid. Now listen, don't make any noise at all, especially if somebody calls out your name. Some people want to kill you, understand? But I'm here, so don't be afraid. Don Corleone, still not fully conscious of what had happened to him the day before, in terrible pain, yet smiled benevolently on his youngest son, wanting to tell him, but it was too much effort. Why should I be afraid now? Strange men have come to kill me ever since I was 12 years yes. old. He knew he didn't have much time, so he ran out of the room and down the four flights and through the wide doors of the ground floor entrance. Off to the side, he saw the ambulance yard. A young man was walking swiftly down from Ninth Avenue, a package under his arm. The young man wore a combat jacket and had a heavy shock of black hair. His face was familiar when he came under the lamplight, but Michael could not place it. But the young man stopped in front of him and put out his hand, saying in a heavy Italian accent, Don Michael, do you remember me? Enzo, the baker's helper to Nazarene at the Penitera, his son-in-law. Your father saved my life by getting the government to let me stay in America. Michael shook his hand. He remembered him now. I've come to pay my respects to your father. Will they let me into the hospital so late? Michael smiled and shook his head. No, but thanks anyway. I'll tell the Don you came. A car came roaring down the street, and Michael was instantly alert. Leave here quickly. There may be trouble. You don't want to get involved with the police. He saw the look of fear on the young Italian's face. Trouble with the police might mean being deported or refusal of citizenship. But the young man stood fast. He whispered in Italian, if there's trouble, I'll stay to help. I owe it to the godfather. Michael was touched. He was about to tell the young man to go away again, but then he thought, why not let him stay? Two men in front of the hospital might scare off any of Salazzo's crew sent to do a job. One man almost certainly would not. They had almost finished their cigarettes when a long, low, black car turned into 30th Street from 9th Avenue and cruised toward them, very close to the curb. It almost stopped. Michael peered to see their faces inside. The car seemed about to stop, then speeded forward. Somebody had recognized him. Michael gave Enzo another cigarette and noticed that the baker's hands were shaking. To his surprise, his own hands were steady. They stayed in the street, smoking, for what was no more than ten minutes, when suddenly the night air was split by a police siren. A patrol car made a screaming turn from Ninth Avenue and pulled up in front of the hospital. Two more squad cars followed right behind it. Suddenly, the hospital entranceway was flooded with uniformed police and detectives. Michael heaved a sigh of relief. Good old Sonny must have gotten through right away. He moved forward to meet them. Two huge, burly policemen grabbed his arms. Another frisked him. A massive police captain, gold braid on his cap, came up the steps, his men parting respectfully to leave a path. He was a vigorous man for his girth, and despite the white hair that peeked out of his cap, 
His face was beefy red. He came up to Michael. I thought I got all you guinea hoods locked up. Who the hell are you and what are you doing here? One of the cops standing beside Michael said, He's clean, Captain. Michael didn't answer. He was studying this police captain, coldly searching his face, the metallic blue eyes. A detective in plain clothes said, That's Michael Corleone, the Don's son. What happened to the detectives who were supposed to be guarding my father? Who pulled him off that detail? The police captain was choleric with rage. You fucking hood! Who the hell are you to tell me my business? I pulled him off. I don't give a shit how many Dago gangsters kill each other. If it was up to me, I wouldn't lift a finger to keep your old man from getting knocked off. Now get the hell out of here. Get out of this street, you punk, and stay out of this hospital when it's not visiting hours. Michael was still studying him intently. He was not angry at what this police captain was saying. His mind was racing furiously. Was it possible that Salazzo had been in that first car and had seen him standing in front of the hospital? Was it possible that Salazzo had then called this captain and said, How come the Corleone's men are still around the hospital when I paid you to lock them up? Was it possible that all had been carefully planned, as Sonny had said? Everything fitted in. Still cool, he said to the captain, I'm not leaving this hospital until you put guards around my father's room. The captain didn't bother answering. He said to the detective standing behind him, Phil, lock this punk up. The kid is clean, Captain. He's a war hero. He's never been mixed up in the rackets. The papers could make us stink. The captain started to turn on the detective, his face red with fury. God damn it, I said lock him up. Michael, still thinking clearly, not angry, said with deliberate malice, How much is the Turk paying you to set my father up, Captain? The police captain turned to him. He said to the two burly patrolmen, Hold him. Michael felt his arms pinned to his sides. He saw the captain's massive fist arching toward his face. He tried to weave away, but the fist caught him high on the cheekbone. A grenade exploded in his skull, his mouth filled with blood and small, hard bones that he realized were his teeth. He could feel the side of his head puff up as if it were filling with air. His legs were weightless, and he would have fallen if the two policemen had not held him up. But he was still conscious. The plainclothes detective had stepped in front of him to keep the captain from hitting him again. Jesus Christ, Captain, you really hurt him. I didn't touch him. He attacked me and he fell. You understand that? He resisted arrest. Through a red haze, Michael could see more cars pulling up to the curb. Men were getting out. One of them he recognized as Clemenza's lawyer, who was now speaking to the police captain, suavely and surely. The Corleone family has hired a firm of private detectives to guard Mr. Corleone. These men with me are licensed to carry firearms, Captain. If you arrest them, you'll have to appear before a judge in the morning and tell him why. The lawyer glanced at Michael. Do you want to prefer charges against whoever did this to you? Michael had trouble talking. His jaws wouldn't come together, but he managed to mumble. I slipped. I slipped and fell. He saw the captain give him a triumphant glance, and he tried to answer that glance with a smile. At all costs, he wanted to hide the delicious, icy chilliness that controlled his brain. <laughs> 